Hey YouTubers, it's me again, Nuts for Art, and I'm going to be reading another Continuing on the Poison Power by Dr. John Goffman, Dr. Arthur Tamplin. We're in Chapter 11. I was interrupted by a phone call. It was sweet, someone telling me, Happy New Year. We're on Chapter 11, Must We Hold Out for the Cold Corpses? And this is so outrageous, probably a good thing I got stopped. Okay, here we go. Listen to this. A little later, the incidence of thyroid cancer became so common in irritated humans that it had to be acknowledged. The experts revised their reports of radiation hazards to include the risk of thyroid cancer risk. They were now considering leukemia and thyroid cancer as radiation caused, but no other cancers. So it continues up to the moment of writing this book. Even though cancer of the lung, the breast, the thyroid, the, the pharynx, the lungs, the stomach, the lymph glands, and bone have been unequivocally proved to occur in human subjects as a result of radiation, the standard setting bodies are just beginning to consider some of these cancers in their calculations. Having embarked upon a course of action that can charitably be called public health in reverse, those charged with setting radiation standards persist in their errors and continue seriously to underestimate the true hazard of exposing people to radiation. Good, we're only two minutes in. And so nuclear electricity development and atomic technology in general, in general, both proceed under a set of standards permitting radiation exposure of the population that can lead to a massive public health calamity. All the while, the public is reassured by pronouncements that eminent scientists are constantly reviewing the standards. In fact, they're reviewing them right now to say, guess what, hormesis, that radiation is probably really good for us. Wait, wait till we see what happens in 2016 with that determination, folks. Back to the book. We were, the authors of this book, finally awakened to the unbelievable galaxy of errors represented in this standard setting. We exposed it publicly. Repeat. Let's repeat that. When we, the authors of this book, the two scientists, the doctors, finally awakened to the unbelievable galaxy of errors represented in this standard setting, we exposed it publicly. We were accused of making a direct frontal attack on all radiation standards. Indeed, we are making a direct frontal attack, and proudly. The account will, we hope, convince the public how long overdue such a massive direct attack is. Now this is a doctor saying we need to directly confront these people. Unfortunately, any criticism of erroneous public health practices is likely to be misinterpreted as an attack upon the motives of the men involved. Well, I'm not so sure. Maybe it needs to be. We intend no such implications, nor even consider it in questioning their standard-setting procedures. These men are, after all, human. All of us learn through our errors, and few indeed have escaped serious errors of judgment in one or another aspect of their lives. But it is best not tragic and inexcusable <clears throat> Let me repeat that. But it is not tragic. And in it, I think he's asking a question. Hold on. But is it not tragic and inexcusable to persist in the errors of the past? Oh, that's a good sentence. But is it not tragic and inexcusable, Bush and Cheney, Obama, stupid fucks? Excuse my language. Oops, I did cuss. <laughs> but it is not, but is it not tragic and inexcusable to persist in the errors of the past? 
The defensiveness of those scientists involved is leading directly to this tragedy. It appears certain that it will take public pressure to introduce a rational note into the radiation nuclear energy scene, which is why we have right now insanity, because the public is has been convinced it's no big deal. We cannot refrain from addressing the issue of conflict of interest, and we do not and we do this not to impugn motives. Public officials are routinely required to divest themselves of holdings that might represent or be considered to represent a conflict with execution of their public duties. Yet most of the scientists who serve on the various radiation standard setting committees are directly or indirectly in the employ of the nuclear industry or the atomic energy government bureaucracy. Some are recipients of major university research grants from these same agencies. Hmm. The conflict of interest may be subconscious, but it is inescapable. Men can hardly be expected to consider civic responsibility exclusively when they cannot be when they cannot be unaware that certain of their actions may well result in drying up sources of support for their research or for their salaries. This is a hopeless situation from which to extract objective performance. It is the very reason for our rather strict codes in such potential conflict of interest situations for public servants. Exactly, just like that guy from uh, the University of Oregon who graduated Ruiz. Remember that guy? I think that was his last name or something like that. He's now a major corporation recipient. Obama gave him, what, a $2 million check the year after he graduated a university as a nuclear scientist. Outrageous. Recently, one of us was lecturing in a university classroom considering the leukemia and cancer hazard from ionizing radiation. A fellow professor attending the lecture asked, if the Atomic Energy Commission pays to support your research, why do you criticize radiation as a hazard? The deep implications of this question, undoubtedly asked in great innocence, must not be lost upon the public. If the source of research funds is expected to buy silence, concerning hazards of major public concern, we are assuredly in very deep trouble as a society. This is precisely where we're at. If the source of research funds is expected to buy silence concerning hazards of major public concern, we are assuredly in very deep trouble as a society. Many scientists would not ask this question so directly. They would simply remain silent about public health hazards of technology if they sensed that speaking out might cost them their jobs or their research funds. Nor is it particularly hard to understand why. The heavy hand of reprisal by vested interests, governmental or private, is very widely appreciated. New subtitle, Radiation Standards, How They Should Have Been Handled. We have noted that everything, the philosophy and execution for promulgating human radiation exposure standards has been wrong. But this is the set of standards under which the nuclear electricity in industry is proliferating. The conservative public health practice of caution on the side of health of the public has been neglected totally. What would have been a reasonable approach? First and foremost, it is unthinkable to require human corpses before a standard setting body will act to protect the public health. A procedure for effective action should have been developed based on the cardinal set of public health principles that does not require human experiments. Number one, at all times remember that our ignorance concerning biology and medicine is great compared with our knowledge. Number two, 
In ignorance, refrain. Number three, where unknowns exist, always err on the side of protecting the public health. Giving technology leeway by later relaxation is always possible, whereas alternate approaches can lead to irreversible human injury. Why should the standard setting bodies demand human disaster as a guide for sa setting safe standards? Experimental animal studies available for decades prove conclusively what needed to be known. Virtually every form of cancer and leukemia had already been produced in several animal species provided radiation was absorbed in the appropriate organ. Furthermore, these studies indicated a 5% or greater increase in cancer occurrence rate for a variety of cancers per rad of exposure. Excuse me, I need some water. Uh, a responsible society applying sound public health principles would have assumed that all forms of human cancer and leukemia would be induced at least as easily by radiation as they were in the most sensitive experimental animal. Conservatism, conservatism would suggest assuming the human to be even more sensitive. Proceeding in this manner, it would have been estimated that all forms of cancer and leukemia would increase by 5% for each rad in human exposure accumulated. Now we can estimate how we would have evaluated the implications of a particular exposure level for the population. Suppose we estimate the consequences of developing nuclear electricity and other atomic programs working with a, quote, permissible dose of 0.17 rad average for the population. The chosen value 10 years ago, the chosen, excuse me, the value chosen 10 years ago by the Federal Radiation Council. Now let us ask ourselves, if this value, 0.17 rad, would really have become codified, or if the calculation would have led to a far more stringent guidelines for radiation exposure. It would have been reasonable to choose 30 years of age as a representative age for an average person who might be affected. By age 30, a person receiving 0.17 rad per year would have accumulated 30 times 0.17 one seven or approximately five rads of total body exposure. At earlier ages, the accumulated exposure would, of course, have been lower. But evidence has long existed to indicate that the sensitivity to cancer induction by radiation is materially higher at early ages. Now we realize the sensitivity in utero is extremely high. Furthermore, the lower accumulated dose at early ages would be counterbalanced by more than five rads accumulated at the ages beyond 30 years. Do you guys get that mouth? I don't know. I won't reread it again, but I think you get it. By simple arithmetic, if five rads is the average accumulated dose, and if, as experimental animal data shows, that will stop much quicker. That's my cell phone. <laughs> so we can just listen to that one stop. Okay, we'll read this again. By simple arithmetic, if 5 rads of average accumulated dose, and if, as experimental animal data shows, there's a 5% increase in cancer plus leukemia per rad, then multiplying the two, we should expect a 25% increase in the death rate if our population were exposed to 0.17 rad per year. 25% increase, and the radiation exposure is much higher. This estimate would undoubtedly have shocked even the most hardened individuals.
In the United States, there are some 320,000 cancer plus leukemia deaths each year. A 25% increase would mean an additional 80,000 80,000 deaths from cancer and leukemia annually. And we have seen that, probably much, much higher. If this simple arithmetic had been done by the standard setting committees 15 years ago, the experimental data were available then, it is extremely doubtful that the 0.17 rad per year would have been chosen as an allowable exposure. It is extremely doubtful that national programs like nuclear electricity generation would have been allowed to develop under such a guideline. The conclusion would have been self-evident. This is far too high a population exposure to contemplate. The standard setting committees did not go through this simple arithmetic. Get that, folks? The standard setting committees did not go through this simple arithmetic. While their sincerity and devotion is not to be questioned, and I say, why not? Their judgment and comprehension of public health most certainly must be. The committees neglected the animal, the committees neglected the animal data, which would have wa ra waved a red flag at them and demanded human evidence before reducing the allowable radiation exposure to the public health. Now let us see whether this approach, using the experimental animal evidence, would have misled us or would have provided very sound guidance. By now, to our sorrow, human evidence is available for all major forms of cancer and leukemia induced by ionizing radiation. Whatever the results are for a few remaining minor forms of cancer, they cannot alter the picture significantly. Further, extensive human evidence shows a 2% increase in cancer per rat of exposure in young adults. Again, using our 30-year-old person as representative with 5 rads accumulated in the allowable annual exposure, we have 5 times 2, or a 10% increase. Oops or it's 10% increase in cancer plus leukemia to be expected. And 10% of 320,000 is 32,000 extra deaths from cancer plus leukemia annually to be expected if the population received the allowable 1.17 rad per year. This is where the information, remember I often say this, 32,000 extra cancers, that's what this is about. So let me read that again so we get it. <clears throat> again, using the age of a 30-year-old person as representative with five rads accumulated at the allowable annual exposure rate. So they're saying we have five rads we allowable uh, annually exposed. We have five times two because we have the 2% increase. Human evidence shows a 2% increase. Five times two or a 10% increase. Wow. Per red, five times two percent. Further extens extensive human evidence shows a two percent increase in cancer per rad of exposure in young adults. So if we have five times two is ten, so we have a ten percent increase. And so at a ten percent increase of three hundred and twenty thousand, we get thirty two thousand extra cancers. Independently, Professor Linus Pauling estimated 96,000 extra cancers plus leukemia deaths annually. Comparing these estimates, 32,000 to 96,000 extra deaths annually, with the 80,000 that would have with the 80,000 that would have been arrived at from the experimental animal data, we realize immediately that the animal data would have provided a sound guidance indeed. Moreover, the animal data would not have been at all super conservative, for the human evidence now available shows there was no margin for safety. Wow. The issue is not whether the estimate of 80,000 extra cancer plus leukemia deaths 
annually for exposure of the entire population at 0 0.17 rad would have been exactly correct. The real point is that the expected numbers would have been in the tens of thousands, not near zero. Had this been appreciated and announced 15 years ago, nuclear electricity generation could have been more rationally evaluated in the light of realistic appraisal of the potential future hazard. The electric utility industry would not have been mistakenly lured into nuclear power by false and meaningless assurances of safety to humans in allowable doses of radiation. It is truly pathetic to see how the misapplication of public health principles has deceived a major industry, including its executives, physicists, and engineers. The deep and widespread misinformation has led these scientists and engineers to design and install nuclear reactor systems with a delusion as to their true margin of safety. A real appreciation of the cancer leukemia hazard of radiation would doubtless have altered the outlook of the nuclear electricity industry. Whenever design and engineering are carried through with a false idea of a margin of safety, and in this instance, false by 100 to 1,000 fold, real danger lies ahead. I think I'll stop here. Wow, this is getting really amazing. Put your courage feet on, you guys. And you know what? We really need to, I hope you get this book and you can quote it for yourself because we need to really dig into this. We need to educate our elected officials because these people have no idea what they're quoting as safe and not safe. We're seeing the deaths all around us and it's time for it to end. We need to save our planet. So put your courage feet on, you guys. And uh, have a safe and happy new year and you know when I say happy you know what happiness is doing your mission doing what you know you're supposed to do and listening because we're here on purpose so put your courage feet on you guys be safe happy new year